Well, my dear friends, as you'll very quickly realize, I'm a lot more echoey than normal, and that's because today's recording session is literally taking place in an underground... Well, I don't think it's a dungeon, but it's pretty damn creepy down here. Um, it's pitch black. I'm scared out of my mind, so let's just hope I get through this recording session all right. <laughs> Revenge. The subject of today's video. Is it sweet? Is it best served cold? Should we believe those who say we should reconcile our pasts? Let the pain go and just get on with our lives. Well, I can tell you that's not what happens in tonight's video. Two stories for you, each telling their own tales of poetic justice. Sit back and relax with your favorite drinks, my dear friends, because it's time to listen. The rock came down hard with a sickening thud. The rushing sound in her ears drowning out the drivers excited. Oh, dude. And the click of the shutter as the woman in the passenger seat turned and snapped a picture with her phone. She could feel the warm blood rolling over her right eye and down her cheek. She tried to reach up and cover her wound, but it was useless. It's the drugs, she thought. That's why I can't move. She slumped over, her head coming to rest on his shoulder. The man wrapped his arm around her, taking her head in his hand. Ah, oh, poor thing. She's having a rough night, the man behind the wheel said, with mock sympathy. Dude, can you please change the fucking music? The man in the back seat yelled as he slowly stroked her hair. Ah, shut the fuck up, Billy, came from the woman with the phone, not even looking up from it as she reached for the volume and cranked it louder. Yeah, you're such a bitch, Abby, Billy said. The man behind the wheel chuckled, and Abby smacked his arm, looking at her phone. Dick. Flashes of light from passing cars were the only thing keeping her from losing consciousness. She wanted to leave the gruesome reality in the moving vehicle behind, but those goddamn lights kept flashing in her eyes, each one causing a shooting pain in her head. She wanted to go home, hug Sasha, wash the ever-growing blood stain out of her favorite dress, lie down, and finally finish the 15 pages of the book she'd been trying to read for six months. But she knew that wasn't going to happen. The lights kept coming. Abby turned and raised her phone. Smile pretty, she said, snapping another picture. Click. Oh, oh aren't you two the cutest? Abby put the phone in the front of the driver's face. See, aren't they adorable? <laughs> he pushed the phone out of the way. <sighs> I'm trying to drive, babe. He glanced in the rear view, and the woman in the back seat met his gaze in the mirror. For a moment, barely able to focus, but still able to see his smirk, before his eyes went back to the road. She'd seen that smirk many times before, usually when he'd come to the office to meet Abby for lunch. Hey, Claire, Ab's running late again, he'd ask, as if he didn't already know the answer. Was there any doubt? She'd answer smoothly, rolling her eyes. Ah, oh, well then, maybe I should just take you to lunch instead, he'd say, leaning in with a wink, that smirk crossing his lips. It was, in fact, this half-smile that had convinced her to go out that night. Abby had suggested she go out and have a few drinks with them after work. She had tried to decline. Oh, come on, Claire, it's Friday, he'd exclaimed, grabbing her shoulders and shaking her gently, and with that mischievous grin said, You know you want to. Claire eventually relented. After trying to make up some bullshit excuses about having to get home and feed her cat, or how she had to get up early for one thing or another. 
She had nearly slipped up and told the truth about what she actually planned for the morning, but managed to cover it up right away. Careful, Claire, she'd thought. After she finally agreed to meet them later, she finished up her day's work and excitedly rushed home. She called a neighbor, the one with the butterfly collection that Sasha loved so much, and the woman happily agreed to keep an eye on the little girl. You know, Sasha is always welcome. She changed into her favorite dress, fixed her makeup, found that pair of heels that she thought made her legs look amazing, and scented herself to perfection. She'd thoroughly inspected her reflection in the mirror, making sure she had no single hair out of place, and confidently stepped out the door. Holy motherfuck, dude. Aren't we there yet? Billy whined from the back seat, still stroking Claire's hair, blood now staining his shirt and small drops dotting his jeans. We'll be there shortly, said the driver, as he turned off the main road and down an unmarked gravel path. Eh, thank God, Abby moaned. I have to pee so bad. She was still looking at her phone moving only to occasionally turn and take a picture. Click. Claire was fading. She could no longer focus, only seeing blurry shapes and light trails. She tried to speak. I'm, I'm sorry. Please. But only tiny murmurs escaped her lips. Hey, pretty girl. She felt Billy's breath on her ear as he whispered to her. Stay with me. We haven't even gotten to the best part. He put two fingers under her chin and lifted her head slightly so he could see her face. Once Claire had arrived at the bar, the couple was already there. They stood at the bar, drinks in hand. Another man stood with them. Abby elbowed the man in the ribs and nodded towards Claire as she approached them a very familiar smirk crossing his face. Hey, Claire Bear, Abby squealed. Oof, she's already had a few, Claire thought. This, Abby gave the man a little shove towards her, is Billy, Nate's brother. Claire looked at Abby, then to Nate. Um, hi. Claire's eyes came to rest on the outstretched hand in front of her, and she uneasily reached for it as she again scanned the couple's faces for any sign of explanation. She found none. Uh, I'm guessing my brother and his lovely wife didn't tell you this was a setup, huh? Billy gestured to Abby and Nate with his thumb, while taking Claire's hand in his other hand. Oh, his skin is so soft. No, they sure didn't. Claire gave them both a stern look. No, they hadn't told her. But Claire wasn't really unhappy with this deception. Not even a deception, just an omission, really. Claire looked at Billy. His features were so startlingly similar to Nate's. Are they twins? I'm two years older, Nate said as if to answer her unasked question. She couldn't take her eyes off him, and realized she still had hold of his hand, and she promptly let go. <laughs> Jesus, Claire, get a hold of yourself. He smirked that familiar smirk. Can I get you a drink? God, do you have to hit every rock in the fucking road? Abby said angrily. I told you, I have to piss. Jesus Christ, Abs, chill the fuck out. We're here. Nate stopped the car and turned off the engine, but left the headlights on. Claire looked out the windshield, a blurry white mass straight ahead. No, no, no. Claire had been having a great time at the bar, though as the night went on, she'd begun to feel uncomfortable. Billy had kept her attention throughout the night, bringing her drinks and asking her questions. Those questions, however, had started to get strange. 
All the while, Nate and Abby whispered to each other, rarely taking their eyes off Claire. Oh, shh, they know something, she thought, her head beginning to spin a little. But how could they know? She felt as though she was being watched, like there were dozens of eyes on her. But when she looked around, everyone seemed to be having their own private conversations. She would have left at that point, if not for her utter infatuation with Nate, and now with Billy, by proxy. After her fourth drink, and the strangest, most unsettling question of the night, do you think the last person to tell you they loved you meant it? <sighs> what the actual fuck? Claire excused herself without answering and walked towards the restroom. She felt unsteady, the spinning in her head moving faster. By the time she made it to the door, she could barely stand. They drugged me. They fucking drugged me. She opened the door and, using the walls to steady herself, made it to the first open stall. She turned to try and close the stall door but instead fell into it and slid to the floor. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Abby was standing over her. Hey, Claire Bear, looks like you had a few too many. She reached down and pulled Claire to her feet. Let's go, gorgeous. We've got places to be. Claire tried to object, but the words coming out of her mouth were nonsense. No, oh, please, please. No, I'm sorry. I'll give it back. I'm, I'm sorry. Nate and Billy were standing just outside the restroom. Billy took Claire, putting her arm on his shoulder and wrapping his arm around her waist, while Nate and Abby walked slightly ahead. When they got into the car, which was the lone vehicle parked in the gravel overflow lot in the back, Abby opened the door while Billy sat Claire down on the seat. And slid her legs in. Claire made a desperate grab for the doorframe, but only managed to topple sideways. Billy closed the door and walked around to get in behind the passenger seat. Claire saw him pick up something from the ground just before he reached in and sat her upright, gently pushing her head back against the seat, facing it away from him and closing his door. The car began to move. Suddenly, Claire felt a sharp pain on the side of her head, followed by a loud rushing in the ears. Claire tried to focus on the white mass illuminated by the headlights as she moved closer to it. It looks like a marshmallow. Claire would have laughed at the thought if she could. It was absurd. I'm going to die soon. She heard a door creak open, and was led through a black void in the white blur. She could hear sounds, voices, whispering all around her. She was carried through the room, her feet dragging the floor, no longer able to discern who was around her. She was placed on a cold, hard surface. Oh, please. She heard a voice in her ear. Goodbye, Claire Bear. Tears streamed down her face. Claire saw nothing but flashes, coupled with the familiar click. All the whispers around her faded into one echoing voice, filling her with dread, sorrow, and guilt. It's time. No one ever believed the children. No matter how much they begged and pleaded to be heard, their voices were always silenced with disdain and chastisement. Obviously, they had to be lying. Making up stories, besmirching the name of a good and God-fearing man. Besides, the accusations were too vile for anyone to comprehend. The authorities were never summoned. The perpetrator never questioned. It was as if the entire community rallied behind this facade of integrity and piety, 
or turning a blind eye to such blatant wickedness. Blaming the so-called victims was much easier, if not safer, than facing the truth and acknowledging their own guilt. Unfortunately, many believed, and still do, that sexual abuse was a white man's disease, a burden he and his community must bear. <sighs> Can I get an amen? Those who were deemed as soiled, if you will, who knew the man hidden behind the mask of righteousness was truly a monster, bristled with a quiet rage as they had to endure the hypocrisy he spewed from the pulpit every Sunday. The congregation's admiration and loyalty was repulsive, a sickening reminder of how one man's deceitfulness could, eerily, become the gospel for others. Beaten down and emotionally drained, his victims discovered various ways to cope with the years of degradation and lack of self-worth. Mona Smalls, whose mother responded to her daughter's accusations by brutally beating her with a strap, which in her distorted and warped mind was saving her only child's soul, soon realized her affinity for self-mutilation. Razors, butcher knives, scissors, safety pins, even cigarettes. Mona utilized anything that could cause her intense pain. Soon, her body became a tapestry of bruises and scars. Morris Kelly was only eight years old when he learned that evil could easily masquerade as love and kindness. That a warm and inviting smile could be nothing more than trickery and deception. His heartache manifested in the most despicable way, for he found himself playing the role of the offender. With hooded eyes and a blackened soul, Morris would, vigorously, scour the neighborhood in search of ripe innocence. He knew just what to look for, and when his prey was in sight, he would pounce. Over the years, he became a most prolific abuser, using intimidation and shame as a weapon against retaliation. There were countless others who tried their best to move past the shame and embarrassment. But, sooner or later, they acquiesced to their inner demons and self-destructed one by one. And the root of all the angst and turmoil was one man, who emerged from the destruction he created unscathed. In fact, as the years progressed, the Reverend flourished within the protective confines of the church. He was the pillar of the community, a true example of morality. He was a goddamn fraud. His death could only be described as a work of art. His screams were sublime, his cries for mercy poetic. Days had passed before his mutilated corpse was discovered. Several police officers, many of them seasoned veterans, fought the urge to vomit as they waded through the carnage. The metallic scent of blood permeated the air, while chunks of flesh and entrails were strewn about the floor in gore-soaked heaps. He, literally, had been ripped open and gutted as if by some ravenous animal. The police were aghast by such ferocity and hatred. Scrawled in blood on the wall read the words, The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar and the truth is not in him. Amen. The cries of anguish engulfed the sanctuary as inconsolable mourners, still in shock, paid their last respects to the reverend. Soon their wails became uncontrollable, and several attendees collapsed in the aisles. As chaos ensued, there was an unusual calmness exhibited by those who felt no remorse, but relief. Almost a sheer giddiness because now, the monster was dead. Each of these individuals shared quick glances of recognition and approval. 
They watched in amusement, as family and friends, in the throes of absolute sorrow, made complete spectacles of themselves. The devastation they were witnessing was vindication, and it was exhilarating. Of course, they all wondered which one of them found the courage to slay the dragon. Amongst the sympathetic stares and silent adulation, there was never a hint of ownership or accountability. But it really didn't matter. He was gone. No one ever believed the children. An indignity which was, later, rectified in the most horrific way. Amen. A couple of stories there for you. A little bit to think about in that first one especially. What did she do? What was she feeling guilty for? What had they found out? The second one? Well, damn right, if you ask me. Um, that's it for tonight. Back again on Wednesday. Might be back in my echoey dungeon for another recording session, so I apologize in advance for the different sound of my voice down here in the dark. Now, you all have a safe evening. Sweet, sweet dreams. I'll be back again real soon, but for now, bye-bye.